Wonderful. So before I introduce these two women, I'd like to thank you all for attending this event and to let you know that the Peter Bulla Foundation is currently accepting applications for our fall 2022 artist residencies. You can find out more information on the residencies tab on our website at peterbullafoundation.org. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Lauren Bacchus, who is a textile artist and researcher whose work centers around the construction of Caribbean identity and womanhood through textile and costume. She is strongly influenced by Masquerade and the region's legacy of resistance and storytelling through cloth and clothing. Her most recent project, Salt and Aloes, is an archive of Caribbean material culture over the past century. She is currently completing a master's in textiles and material culture from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. And with her, we have Utisam Zaman, who is a multidisciplinary artist who focuses on painting traditional and narrative portraiture, still life objects, and abstract expressions. Her work is inspired by Persian Islamic geometric art, Indian classical art, surrealism, modern realism, and abstract expressionism. At age six, she moved from Tulsa, Oklahoma to England, followed by the UAE. Her mother made the decision shortly after 9-11 to escape the violence that Muslims and Black, Indigenous, people of color are still facing today. By 13, she had lived in both the UAE and India for nine years, where she became a multilingual outsider. She says, my skin tone and fluency gave me access to communities willing to accept me for my external features, but not the hidden identities I carry. She creates to clarify the ambiguity of far and near places, to humanize identities of people regardless of ethnicity, education, sexuality, or gender. In her paintings lie the struggles against injustice and the prayer for a brighter tomorrow. She holds and heals communities through her painting, expression, and process. This work is her determination for truth, empowerment, and liberation. As a Black, lesbian, multilingual, and intersectional feminist in an art world designed by and for white heteronormative masculinity, she owns the tools to create this political work. This is her purpose as an artist. And now I'm delighted to turn it over to the two of them to discuss their work. That was, so, thank you, Katie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Katie. It's been great to be here. And I'm struck by that. Can I start it off with you? Yes, I'm struck please. by that bio first because it's beautiful and all encompassing, but also there was a word in there that was prayer. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about prayer in your work and, and what that means to you? Oh, wow. Yes, I can. Um, so I was raised, first I'll give a little bit of backstory about um, myself. I was raised Muslim. Um, and I, I guess I would consider us to have been a very pious mm. family growing up, like very um, involved in like going to the mosque. Uh, early on, like I learned how to read the Quran. And so prayer was and continues to be a big part of my life mm -hmm. and culture. Although the, in terms of like what prayer is or how I do it mm -hmm. has changed um, drastically. I no longer identify as um, Muslim, uh, as Muslim besides culturally. Um, I hold on to that, and that that's a, a place that's very close to my heart, and I consider myself an advocate and an ally against um, Islamophobia. I have many family members who are still Muslim, who still call themselves Muslim, mm -hmm. um, and I respect many, many, many parts of the religion, but I think it's definitely informed my work in terms of how I go about making something. Mm -hmm. I want to, I'm always trying to, I think about when I'm lo looking at a piece, how do I want it to make me feel? Okay. And I think as we are inhabiting, we've talked a lot about this actually throughout the residency, yeah. us as people who inhabit Black bodies, who are then making art that is about ourselves and about the people we come from and the communities we live in which then extends to the black body further and other black bodies and how that's tying into a bigger um, traumatic 
uh, history mm -hmm. tied to racism and systemic oppression and all of these um, and white supremacy. Because there's nothing contained, right? Because like, there's nothing contained, It just kind of right. goes on and on and on and on and on. And I think like it's, there's something about the work itself that is very, it makes it manifest and it kind of anchors it in something, right? Like it anchors a feeling in something material, you know? Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. And I think in terms of like being placed where we are specifically within the art history movement mm -hmm. like in 10 years we'll know like 30 years from now we'll know whatever this movement is but i think my position within this moment in time what i want to do with my work is to make work that is about all of the issues listed in, in my artist statement mm -hmm. but to do it in a way that does not feel gut-wrenching yeah because at a certain point don't you feel at times like i just want to make like i just want to make things right I like just i just want to make things, things. yeah and and not have it be the i hate to use the word heavy but there's a and we've talked about this too there's this all this book that i've also been reading throughout the course of me being here and before i got here and that um I was put onto by a by a friend as well, who's done a lot of work around um, post-colonial Caribbeanness, right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and identity, and um, memory, and this idea of how do we exist beyond resistance mm -hmm. as Black and and well people of color, but we're speaking specifically about Black bodies, right? How do we exist beyond resisting? or exist beyond resisting. And if you're always in this kind of fight in the book, um, what's the title? Kevin Kwashi. It's, um, uh, the, you know, it's in my head, but I, <laughs> I'll remember it and I'll bring it. It'll we'll come write back. it in the chat. Exactly. Um, but it is, it's incredible to think of, of blackness always having to be in conversation with a world that's in opposition to it. And mm -hmm. if you're always in this stance of anti something, there's really no room for yourself just as a, as, as someone who's just experiencing the world as a person, right? And like the interiority, and there's a lot in the book about interiority and just kind of like what that looks like and feels like and how we process through that. So I feel like on some level, I feel you, right? Like you want to answer the call of all of those things that are so eloquently mm -hmm. in your, you know, mm -hmm. laid out in your bio. And then sometimes it feels like, man, I just want to, I just want to breathe also too. And how do you breathe and also hold Yeah, that because stuff? I mean, I think, I think one of the, the problems we face is like wanting to make important art that feels necessary. But I also want to make, art that is just about love or about my family or mm -hmm. about um my grandmother I mean she's part of my family obviously but mm -hmm. or like um a train ride I took <laughs> I don't know like or a walk there's so much more there are so many rich things that we can be talking about and delving into within our work and I think it's for us in, in terms of how the world views us and how we are placed in the world and the families in the communities and countries and all of the different privileges or uh, minority statuses that we are born into, mm -hmm. how, we, how do we balance that as artists? That's the thing that then determines our work. Yeah, I've been, you know, it's interesting because I've been drawn I'm always drawn to artists who um, work in like craft, mm -hmm. right? And so are working with another medium, right? Also that is preformed already and then assembling that, right? Wow. So um, like Jeffrey Gibson also working with beads, right? And then mm -hmm. kind of assembling those beads and putting them together and constructing them together. And I think there's something about um, kind of, having that filter of a pre-made object sometimes mm -hmm. and then kind of collecting that and assembling that mm -hmm. that provides a little bit of that buffer mm -hmm. for me as well mm -hmm. um but 
yeah, I want to talk a little bit about your, your actual process and kind of like as you're working through art, um, what your process looks like. What my process looks mm -hmm. like. Um, I will first start off by saying that reading and thinking is probably like 60% of my process. Like just consuming information mm -hmm. and like picking out sentences from stories, from movies. So it's it's very archival. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I have an archive. What's your archive? It's, a, it's, a, it's an archive of different books that I'm reading. And then I'll like <laughs> take excerpts from the books and I'll link them in specific different paintings that I want to include them in. It's very dense. You, you'll include what part of the book? Just the ideas or actual like pieces of the book? But and I'll then I'll tie it into like okay this is the this is where this illustration idea is coming from this is where this illustration idea is coming from um, but it gets so busy that then I get backlogged and so yeah. then I'll like start annotating in books because I'm like and I'll start doing little sketches in the margins mm -hmm. um, so that's a huge part of my process and then once that's done then I'm like making sketches mm -hmm. and because I'm trying to translate the liter literature in terms of into a visual language mm -hmm. that we don't have to then read. And I think this is something mm -hmm. that I have as I'm moving forward with my pieces. It's like a challenge to turn something into um, to turn something into something visual that can then be interpreted as a feeling yeah. as opposed to just giving people information because if they wanted to read the book, I'm quoting a friend of mine, mm -hmm. if they wanted to read the book, they would read the book. But as an artist, I think it's important to then take that information and then make something new, as you said, collecting things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I finally hit a turning point with um, my latest piece in terms of like, bringing the symbolism right into how i can merge information and feelings and um, concepts into something that can just sit with the viewer as opposed to like throwing um, facts at them because you have i feel like i'm asking you all the questions because i'm <laughs> so <laughs> curious about your work because like you and i have been through this process of like okay what are you working on I'm thinking about this. Yeah. And I'm thinking about this, yeah. right? And then seeing what you've worked on previously and then kind of seeing how mm -hmm. your most recent work has evolved. Mm -hmm. Because you have used text a lot before. A lot, and then this yeah. one doesn't have any text within, right? Doesn't have any text, no. For those of you who want sneak yeah. peeks, you could go onto my Instagram to see um, the picture of the painting. It's on my Instagram story. It, the whole thing the whole thing but it's in black and white so you guys don't mm. get to see the color until later um but yeah um there's no text in it i did think about putting text and it's funny because i thought about um i went back and forth in my head about putting quran in it because mm -hmm. there are so many beautiful gorgeous ah just heartwarming verses that are in the Quran that have um, stayed with me for forever. In fact, my mother's favorite, um, one of her favorite chapters, sorry, favorite chapters? No, it's not a chapter, there are 30 chapters and then there are like stories within the chapter. So one of her favorite stories or sections within a chapter is called Al-Duha, which is like the time of dawn. Mm. Um, or right before dawn. Okay. And there's a verse in it, and it's, I haven't left you or abandoned you. There's so many, there's, there's a way of speaking that is so beautiful that I've heard like, this doesn't translate to English, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's no way that you could possibly <laughs> get like the depth of emotion and like the intimacy or just like, a little bit of nuance yeah. and I hear that you know from people who speak Arabic being yeah. able to say like no this is it's not gonna work like it's just <laughs> not the same you know yeah. and I wish English had I wish English had 
you know, the kind of subtlety. And sometimes I think we go for it. People who really kind of exercise language, I think, are, are my heroes. Because I, I don't know, I still kind of struggle. Like, I can see and feel and I can make. But sometimes that language. And I think, like, for us, a lot of times, like, there's so much that language can't do, you know? Mm. And I never... That's a really good point. There's so much that language can't do. And I just feel like, um, for me, I'm just beginning to... I haven't even thought of combining the two. Like, it's never occurred to me to combine language and my actual work. Because... Mm. You know, I was having this conversation recently about carnival, which is kind of my background in, in art, which is a very um, physical kind of art making practice, right? So like you're in a costume, you wear a costume, you perform the costume, yeah. right? Like you interact with people who have seen you in costume, like, and that's just only one part of carnival. Like it's a very kind of physical, yeah. you gotta be there kind of moment. Yeah. So even though there's song in carnival and, and kind of lyric and, you know so much more to that experience for me it's like this idea of being so intimate with with art and art making and also that being part of a community that yeah language for me is still is still a paper based kind of or text it's still very mm. text but you do you do so much reading and writing in I fact so wait and writing. now i want to ask you a question okay please tell me about the love story between you and the material you use oh. and how you found each other. So I love that you're calling it a love story because <laughs> it does feel like a love story. I have such a, a high regard for textile in general. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's because it feels like an underdog <laughs> when it comes to material, like mm -hmm. just kind of objects, right? And art. Um, what I've been using primarily is not necessarily what I've been doing here. So what I've been working on here has been, um, a coat that I've beaded, right? But what I've been working on most is these quilts, these kind of like naked quilts. And I use muslin fabric. This is the fabric you're talking about, right? Is that the fabric you're talking about? I'm, or just I fabric just, in I meant, When I said material, I mean beads. The material. I mean... Oh. all of your materials how do you find them how do you decide how did you find each other what is it yeah like how did it start well I think the love story is is really me and the muslin right <laughs> me and like this woven material and for those who don't know muslin is just um it's just a simple woven cotton that's that's really all it is and I was talking on the live about it that even even though we use it today as like a dressmaker's fabric it's very simple easy cheap fabric I work for a fashion school and it's it's the throwaway fabric that you use to test your actual mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. uh, patterns on right mm -hmm. I see and I've been working I've been working with that to make these series of quilts and they're not assemble quilts they're whole cloth quilts that are um sewn and then stuffed right sewn stuffed and then beaded but I leave a lot open and I think that the love story between me and the material in that respect is really a love story for women's work mm -hmm. and the way that uh, we have contributed in so many ways, in so many invisible ways, right? Like the story that I love or one of the stories I love um, or examples I love is, is kind of like the Vikings, right? Mm -hmm. So like people think of the Vikings as these hard bitten, have to be men, mm -hmm. right? Traveling on these boats, to you know their wage next wars. land to wage war and, and and conquer right and but yet someone made the sails right there's they were still sail there was brute force yes but there was also like textiles and fabric and how did they kind of find themselves across the seas right there was textiles involved and that's just one example like it's called the silk road because right like textiles were a huge part of this this transcontinental passage of body and people and the fact that it was really just textiles at the base of that um, not the only reason but they were a fundamental part of people's movement people's wealth right um, people the way people imagine themselves and I I almost feel like we forget how amazing it is so 
yeah, as a technology, but also as a medium of just identity, right? Like an, an kind of transmission of like, this, this is who I am. Um, that's my love story. And like in that, there's, you know, adornment to that. And of course, I'm a carnival girl, so I like my bead and feather, but there's something really seductive um, about, about the beading that I'm working with. So, you know, I mm -hmm. talk about like the, the beading. That's specifically what I've kind of been branching out into. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it, it gleams and it's pretty and it shines, but I think there's also, um, and they're individual, right? Every bead is a little different. Um, even though they're mass produced and then what mm -hmm. they sit next to, right? Changes kind of. They all tone. hold their own personality. They all hold their own. And I think that there's something about that that draws you in and seduces you in. And I want people to be attracted to, to what I'm making, but I also want you to be so close to it that you realize like, oh shit, that's what it's about. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. oh, it's a little, you know what I mean? It's a little um, more, um, more than just the sparkle and yeah i've been thinking a lot about violence and how that um and how to translate that that's something that is has been with us and there's something about the small intimate work that for me translate this this kind of larger theme of of, of, of violence like these small bites these small bites, these small bites. So it's almost like the act of the weaving, of the sewing. It's, it's violent own too. It's, it's own meditation while you're thinking about it also. Oh, that, yeah, of course. Like it, it, I'm also a kind of person, I don't know about you, but like sometimes if I'm not sure about what I'm doing or if I'm a little, un, you know, insecure about what I'm working on, it's just like, just do the work, right? Because if mm -hmm. I can, mm -hmm. if I can finish this patch of, of, um, beating, I know what I'm doing for at least this much of, or this length of time. I don't have to know like what's happening down the road, but I, I just have to know what's happening here. And that's another, that's a really lovely um, insight I got from Jess Gibson too, who does like the beating. Um, he has done, he's done like a lot of beaded. Um, have you seen those beaded like punching bags? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> and like uh, when he meant, when he said that about his own practice, like I just have to like work yeah i just have to work on this piece and that's yeah. all i need to know i was like yes that I, makes sense that's for something me. that i'm really um trying to learn i was sitting and i was i was painting and then i i stop and i look at it and then i'm like no and then i i go back and then my friend said stop looking at it and paint <laughs> Yeah, because you want to sit back and you want to take it in, you want to do the whole thing. Yeah, it's but it's like, too much. You do have to get into the, but that's what the, the beautiful space of flow, right? You just get in and get out. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you can get in and then you can kind of simmer in the inness of it. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to like worry about getting out. Because yeah. it feels good and you finally arrive at a place where it's like, okay, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to finish this. Can you talk about that moment? Like how often those moments, the flow versus like how often Ooh. like it's the work to get into the flow? Oh my God. You know what? I think it's really, for me personally, I think it depends on how I start my day. Okay. Yeah. So like if I start me starting my day, right. For like studio practice, mm -hmm. like where I want to be productive in terms of like process and um, tangible creating so not reading not writing not ideating mm -hmm. not sketching but painting like physical painting or sewing I need to get up early I need to have my moment with the sun and I need to like drink tea I need to have a full breakfast and then I can go into the studio and start and it mm -hmm. needs to be the first thing that I start doing um, otherwise I just kind of like get a I get a little bit messy mm -hmm. and you can still it, that's not to say that if I don't start my day that way, I can't arrive at that point where I can just be in a flow. Mm -hmm. But I do know that that's just, it makes it a lot easier for me if I go in. It's, I think it's about intention. Mm -hmm. It's about intention. There's a, um, there's an artist, Nathaniel Mary Quinn, and he talks about his, his practice or his like, his routine. Mm -hmm. He wakes up, he, at, you know, he gets into 
the studio at whatever point he goes on a walk he has to go on a walk and then he waits Same. with his wife Aww. and yes and then he gets in the studio and then works for six hours takes a 15 minute break works for six hours takes a 15 minute break works until he's done and like just the rigor of his of his schedule and like to do it when he's having a show back to back to back to back and i was thinking about that i was like there's so much rigor and and discipline involved that people don't mm -hmm. recognize mm -hmm. in art like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I i mean you have your schedule here mm -hmm. has it been set and like every day is the same thing or does it kind of like i have to change it because of because just because See, coming to a residency is a wonderful, beautiful experience, but that doesn't mean your life back home stops. Right. And so you're having, you know, you're still having your Zoom calls for your other meetings, for your other trainings, for yeah. your other jobs, and you're still having your other work. Quite. And we've moved now because of the pandemic, and I think it's important to talk about that because we're creating within the, the, the confines and the limitations of COVID and within the... Um, the erased vanishing points of what COVID has been able mm -hmm. to give us working virtually sometimes. Um, and I think it's important to think about what that means to always be accessible now, yeah. because we were more accessible because of um, globalization and, and how far technology has come. But then once COVID hit in terms of how flipped it was, we all went virtual almost overnight. We, you know, we started FaceTiming with our families more because we couldn't see them. And, you know, then there's more texting. And I feel like we all went on Instagram more. Like, that's kind of crazy. Do Instagram you? Instagram is crazy. I feel like I'm going in tangents, but you post your work on Instagram. Are you actively on Instagram? Not actually. So it's funny. Based on the last week, everybody will think I'm just, I'm posting about my work all the time, but I actually just post. <laughs> <laughs> when I have something and then I'm like okay I can't be on and I delete yeah. the app I delete it when I'm done so you're not engaging I don't at all. like I don't like um I try very very hard not to look at the stories because I'm addicted personally yeah which I'm pretty sure most people who are on Instagram are I am. yeah but I, so for me it's like I recognize how I'll, I'll just leave it at this when I'm on Instagram I'm not working which is so many artists use Instagram as a kind of, as like another outlet, right? Like as another kind of PR marketing platform. So like that is work. Do you not it consider work. it work? It is work, but it's taking so much of what I would consider precious time away yeah. from painting or reading or just doing nothing, which is in another important part of the work, right? Of the work, the whatever, my life. Um, because I think without the formative experiences of the nothingness that I could be doing, this all informs what is then translated into a painting also. Mm -hmm. And I think what comes from Instagram, Instagram for me is like a, is a, if I stay on it, it's, a, it's not good for my um, like emotional and yeah. psychological well-being which is why I made the shift of just being off of it and deleting it once I posted, um, like two months ago, I did this. And I, I have to say I'm much happier. Bless you. <laughs> Cause I think that you said something about like translating text. Cause like, if they want to read the book, they'll read the book, right? Which is not true anymore. Like people won't read the book, they'll read the headline, <sighs> right? Or people won't do the deep dive in the topic or the person, right? they'll just kind of like browse through their profile. And I think it's become shorthand. And so like the same thing, I resist mm. kind of putting too much up there. Um, yeah, or like dividing it maybe, like I need to compartmentalize, like this is Lauren's personal life. And I guess, yeah, I can put up some stuff about what I'm doing that day. And then this is Lauren's, um, Man, I don't usually talk about myself in third person, but you know what I'm saying? Like, like this is my, <laughs> yes. this is like salt and aloes, right? Like, this mm -hmm. is the writing, but like mm -hmm. the, what I'm making, sometimes I don't know how it fits or how, how much of it I should put out there. Um, and and yeah. then it becomes just like public domain and, and yeah. you know what then? Yeah. Good. Like, I could hear the surprise that I put the painting up. And part of the reason yeah. why I put it on the story is because 
well, I went back and forth a lot about it. I was like, should I do it now? Should I now put it up? But I mean, I made it so that people could see it. That's part of it. Mm -hmm. Then the other part is I made it for me and I get to see it. Yeah. Okay. I, can and I, and I, <laughs> I love that for me. <laughs> I do like, I think my Instagram is mostly for me as well. To like kind of mm. see you make a record. That's but the so truth nice. is, uh, yeah, but I mean, the truth is like, it's, it's, being consumed it, all yeah. the time you know yeah. so can i balance. ask you my next question yes i, I brought my phone up <laughs> mine is here too okay kind of. so my question is how does your work inspiration flow is it from is it does it start at material and then you get inspired for the concept or is it vice versa or do they feed off of each other they feed off of each other i think um i I, um, part of, part of, uh, the TV watching, as you know, I love TV, <laughs> part of the TV watching, part of the reading, um, part of my research, <laughs> um, it will all trigger something and, and then I'll have to figure out kind of how, like what material works for it. So I think that's the beauty of being able to work with textiles, but also kind of dibble dabbling in other things and allowing, um, other things to be kind of either added to the material or you know it it kind of um being the groundwork for it but i think i have i figure out a way for it to work whatever idea that i'm having um and the truth is there's a lot of ideas that i have that i can't translate yet because i just don't have the skills right so like i have an idea to create something that i'll need a lot of um technical knowledge around like lighting mm. and sound oh, and wow. audio and i don't know how to do any of that so because wow. i feel like i've reached the not the limit but i feel like there's certain things that i want to talk about to kind of like translate emotionally that i just can't do right now with cloth right kind of like i've hit that point so I have to kind of, I have to still kind of uh, relearn. I, I know that I have to learn a lot of things or find people who can do what I need to do. But I think that's just my own growth as an artist. So for the moment, I kind of just use the materials that are around me and what I can like, oh, I can translate that to that. Like I can do that, right? Like I can, I can yeah. make that jump. But I think what's happening now is that I'm, I'm kind of, jumping beyond what I have the material right now capability for the capacity which is great right, right? Mm -hmm. it's also it's also scary so then my next question is do you are you like a very like I need to do everything myself type artist yeah. so like I want to learn all these things so I can make this piece so you wouldn't like commission out for I would have I would you know me <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> So it's okay. Yeah. Over the past month, I think like you've gotten to know a little mm -hmm. about me and I'm a little bit of like a beep up, like it has to be controlled. Mm. And that's because I just feel like without that, I will go out of control and I am happy to trust other people to do what needs to be done. But as I am still realizing things, I really need to be hands on. What about you? Oh, I'm 100% hands on. I need to like, mm -hmm. I will learn the editing and the lighting and mm -hmm. the, and I will play, I will learn how to play the violin so I can make the soundtrack. I'm, yeah, I'm just but like, what if you level. know, like, you still can't get that violin <laughs> to make the sound, right? Like, but I, then I will try, and, then I will try to learn how to read and write music so that I can compose the piece so that I can give it to the violinist who can. So you can understand See? and translate. Yeah. Yeah. But see, that's how like involved I, I feel like I need to be. And I think that's why that's part of the reason why um, my pieces can be so research heavy. Mm -hmm. But I really do try to um, like I find out like a million and one things about a narrative portrait that I'm creating. Like when I was um, making the piece for Fanny Lou Hamer. Mm -hmm love Fanny Lou Hamer and there are so many things that I learned about her but then it was deciding 
what needed to go into the piece, what was relevant. And then that's very, that's a very personal um, decision, right? Because mm -hmm. it's like what I think is important from her life, from her life, right? Whereas if somebody else had done as much, had read everything that I had read, and watched all the videos that I that I had watched with her speaking and with all of her marches and with all of her wonderful, incredible activism. If you guys don't know about that, I need him in the next piece of research. Um, then they might have made something else based on all of their experiences and what they connected to. Does that make sense? It does. And how much pressure did you feel to tell like the whole story versus knowing like you're actually telling your story, your interpretation? Mm. A lot and I try because it's it's two things I'm trying to do I'm trying to honor the person and I'm trying to tell as much of this story as possible without keeping out anything that could be important but ultimately there are going to be things that don't get in mm -hmm. and there's also going to be things that I mean, there's so many things we also don't know. This mm -hmm. is just one part. You could never know. We could never know. The, the really tender moments of her life, right? The, the, the moments that were not recorded, right? But had a huge impact. Like these very kind of like quiet moments that shift a whole person's life that we can never communicate, right? Like we can, yeah. I can never communicate to you and you then could never translate no you know what i mean to the, no. to the world and i'm not sitting in her presence i'm not like i'm hearing her voice because of a speech she's made but i'm not hearing it firsthand i'm not you know i'm not sitting in the room yeah. with everybody when she's speaking and so these things in terms of how we translate them i think it, it can be it can be challenging yeah so i think what i try to do is just capture their humanity so it's like, there's this, and there's that, and there's that, and then ultimately, there are so many things that I'm not even able to paint about, mm -hmm. and you just go and do the deep dive yourself, incredible yeah. person. I think there's, yeah, you kind of like give it over to people to say, yeah. like, you, now you do what you need to do to, yeah. to get what you, um, to kind of fill in the exactly. blank, 100%. and still knowing that it's, it's not the blank. And I've been thinking a lot about like, again, the capturing and translating for someone else mm -hmm. who is not here, which is what I'm not attempting to do wholly. I think that I'm trying to, I'm trying to allow someone to take back their own story in a kind of way, mm -hmm. as opposed to tell it, because I, I don't think that I'm capable. So like taking ownership. Yeah, allowing, allowing the, the person that I'm thinking about, and I spoke a little bit about this on the live, but um, there is an image of an enslaved man that circulated um, during the Civil War as a abolitionist um, propaganda, pretty much, um, you know, or, or kind of like material, right? Abolitionist material. And in so many ways, his image was, again, co-opted from him after he uh, escaped, right? Enslavement, he, yeah. he escaped enslavement. He kind of ran for his freedom, ran towards his freedom to himself. And then again, his image was taken from him and used. And then it was recently just used again in popular, in popular culture and like the cover of this magazine. And I felt like, man, again, like he hasn't been able to claim ownership of, of himself. And I can't do that for anyone. And, and now we're talking about, you know, a spiritual kind of um, exchange, right? Like now we're talking about something that is beyond the material. And so it's it's like this this psychic um, uh, this psychic conversation that I'm having. Mm. Um, but I forgot where I was going at because I had a, where was I going with that? You were talking about, we were talking about ownership and then giving people the space. Yeah, and I think that's choice. what I'm working, that's what I'm working with now. How do you, how do you, um, yeah, tell, allow someone else to tell their own story, you know, in a way, but like still present it. So the other part that I was thinking about that was a lot of other people's stories lie in 
community and you're going you're doing community art projects yes and I think there's something really important about community building projects and that same I'm going to try and find the language again for it but allowing a community to step in and also tell that story so like things that are collaborative and mm. ways of knowing someone and obviously this is more related to someone who is alive than in our you know in our time but allowing a community to help tell a story you know that can inform so I'm excited for your project I don't know if we can talk about it now but what you have <laughs> going next yes no oh your community um uh not yet okay all right then we're not talking about it we're not talking about it yet. okay <laughs> All right, and I'll pause the two of you there, but I, I have to say I'm loath to like interrupt this. This has been such a wonderful conversation. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, it's been great. All right, well, I will encourage everybody right now, if you have any questions for these two, please go ahead and enter them um, in the Q&A box. It should be in the lower right corner of your screen and I'll share them with them. Um, and we've got a few to kick off. Um, I just want to say how you both talk so much about storytelling, you know, telling other people's stories, telling your own stories, um, telling the story of a community. I don't know if you all both noticed that um, or if that's something you kind of both went in like thinking about storytelling. No. <laughs> Uh, I don't, I didn't necessarily consciously think about it, but I think again, a lot of my um, understanding of art has been a collaborative process, even if I'm alone um, in a making kind of space, that my sense began always as a community um, kind of based orientation, right? Like this, we are making together and we perform together. Um, and you know, I've done that in Carnival and I've done that with, with community murals for a time and, and really just in the past couple of years have allowed myself to create on my own, which has been a little bit different, but I guess I still always, um, yeah, I feel committed to a kind of community for sure. Mm -hmm. I think that I've been thinking about the other side of storytelling um, the one of where you're falling asleep and your mother is reading to you type bedtime stories. And I think, like I grew up looking, my mother just reminded me of this because I sent her a picture of the painting and she just reminded me that I grew up reading all of these beautifully illustrated children's books. And um, I remember that before I could read, I would just sit and like absorb the pictures because they were just gorgeous. My favorite um, illustrators are um, Mercer Mayer and Michael Haig. And they just make these most fantastical, magical um, places and like worlds within their paintings. And so I think that all of these images are now, um, like I've come full circle with all of my influences in, in terms of like, okay, I've been absorbing political things and I've been absorbing. And so now I finally arrived at magical realism and then like telling a story that feels like a fairy tale. And the thing about fairy tales is they, on the outside, they're like so sparkly and pretty and wow. Oh, but actually they're quite dark. Like if we think about like Little Red Riding Hood, Sleeping Beauty, um, Snow White, mm -hmm. any <laughs> Beauty and the Beast, all of these stories are like hard from a, an adult perspective. I'm like, how, are you, how is that reading these? But you can, so I think in terms of like being able to do that to real life, then I think it makes it a little bit more digestible. Yeah, absolutely. Like we're getting the sanitized version. Exactly. Of of fairy tales and I think like we all have our own like um the one that I really loved in Trinidad was her name is La Jablesse and I referenced her a lot and mm -hmm. have you ever have you heard of her her mm -hmm. name is La Jablesse or La Diablesse mm -hmm. and she's um 
she you can find her in different iterations throughout the Caribbean, but she's basically like a tainted woman, right? She lived her life and was cursed by the devil and forever had to be marked by the devil. And she was instructed, right? But they're, that's what they all are. They're instructive yeah. of ways of being and these, um, you know, these, their political instruction for and social instruction for, for kids you know and also adults right and women especially women especially women always women always women <laughs> always women crazy i have to go i have to go look that one up because that sounds excellent lauren and i love i love a fairy tale so I'll bring it back to, I was like the second day, the two of you were here, we were in the library and um, it sees um, like what you're talking about now. I'm reminded we were looking at like the little prince and Jeffrey and I are pulling out some of our favorite illustrative work that is in Dr. Bolo's collection. And we're like, you know, so excited and going through all those. So I'm gonna pivot slightly. Um, while you have been here at the Peter Bolo Foundation, um, have you found inspiration in the foundation, in the surrounding area, in, you know, the, the companionship of each other? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, my God. You go. I found so much inspiration in this entire space and being here. A lot of inspiration from my wonderful company that I have with Lauren. Like, she's just an incredible human. I like, we're going to be best friends. And I think that, I like how you didn't agree. <laughs> they saw me nodding. I was like, yeah. I was like, oh, oh, you don't know we're best friends? We still got work to do? Okay. All right. But um, like, I think in terms of like, even just the conversations that I've had with Lauren and the, from the beginning until now, you can see these conversations feed into the work. And I think that this is such an, like it ends up as Lauren put it so beautifully just um, earlier, it ends up being community work anyway. So like we're having all of these wonderful people and like the connection to you, the connection to Jeffrey, everybody is feeding everything all the time constantly. And I think it was so incredible to just be in this space because you've set up something that feels so whole and healing and it's not easy to do in a space um i because i can name two people who have really been able to do it do it well um and make it like when you walk into the space you just yeah. feel like you could melt in it uh and both of those people are my mothers so <laughs> um yeah i would agree it's it's something it doesn't exist in a bubble, right? Like, so you you come here and you see Dr. Bullet's collection and it really filters through all of your other experience. And I think that it's been really beautiful to see the way Ibtizam has interpreted the collection ah. because it's been it's been um, in your work. Like you, you put some of the collection in the actual work, which I yeah. think is really beautiful and and I love that specificity of like, I was here, I was, it was present, it made a, uh, an impact in my actual work. And I think that it's made an impact beyond that, right? Because like, it's been a place to think and be and breathe outside mm. of how we usually have to operate. And then for myself, I would, I would agree in that um, it's been an important moment for me in terms of how I think of myself as an artist. Mm and um, how I'm relating to other people as an artist um, and time as an artist, right? Because the way you use your time, I think, is different um, when you're in a space of making, right? Um, it's structured differently and intentionally around um, making. But I think for myself, it's been more um, the filter that I've, I've, I've operated or I've used through for Dr. Bullet's collection and the space particularly, and we talked about it, was really just being awestruck of all of the ways that he collected and defined his life through object. And it's it's what's left. It's it's the material <clears throat> kind of remainder, but in truth, he left us with this opportunity and this mm -hmm. legacy, and I recognize the gift of that. So yes, it's the beautiful art. Yes, it's like 
the, the, the precious cups. Yes, it's all of these things, but also he gave us this time. So mm -hmm. I think about the mm -hmm. legacy and what we leave behind and all the things that make us this collection of us and what that looks like. And it, it kind of dovetails with this idea of like interiority, right? Beyond this body, what's, what's, what's the motivation here? What happens in here, you know? And, yeah. and then what remains when the body isn't? you know Ooh. girl yeah lauren said it off oh my gosh i'm, I'm gonna have to go back and rewatch this and like try and absorb <laughs> all of it that was incredible Lauren. that was like uh no i don't have time to think you know like this is this has been an incredible time so i mean it's it's thank you i can't thank you both enough for you know all for three of you right because and then the dog as well like they're all here in spirit <laughs> all here all you know we've got jeffrey of course ghosting um in our panel but uh absolutely absolutely um uh i love this so much so i want to also talk about like i'm gonna like switch tracks a little bit more too so um as you think about other artists i feel like lauren you've answered this like five times over but um what other artists do you draw kind of inspiration from and um, I know you've mentioned Jeffrey Gibson, you've mentioned um, a couple others. I tried to write some down as you go, as we went, but um, how does that kind of impact your work, just seeing different people's things, different people's artwork and their process and their research? Yeah, I know. Um, I, man, you know, I have, That's a lot. No, no, no. It's a lot because <laughs> I think <clears throat> it's different seeing people's work and thinking, oh man, that's amazing, right? Yeah. Or like, that's yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. Or like the skill that someone needed, or like the thought that that went into this work and seeing that um not as part of that community has been really how I operated for a long time, right? Like, and I'm doing my craft and you know, I'm making. Um, but it's not art. And then I think over the past, I would say a couple of years of, of shifting and realizing I am part of that community, mm. right? And there's a valid voice in what I do. Mm. And also it takes a, um, I think you have to identify people who are your tribe in terms of, of art making, you know? And yes, Jeffrey Gibson for sure, El Anitz, we, um, Diedrich, um, a few mm. others who I, who I recognize as for me, bridging this gap between, um, craft and art and who take up this question of, of, um, validity, you know, in terms of craft. Um, and there's also, you know, Caribbean artists who are doing the same thing too, who I, who I recognize as, not that we're on the same level at all, right? But but I can yeah. enter that. I will be though. I can enter that. You know. But I hear what you say. But like, I can enter that community and feel um, as if there's there's conversations to be had, and not simply as a spectator. You know? oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah that's and beautifully put. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's so many people that I have such like a deep admiration for. Um, oh but God, there's so many more who I want to be in conversation with. Yes, and it's different. Actually, Lauren and I have talked a lot about that. Like it's 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 being able to like go into a an art space and look at the work and then or it's the difference between going into an art space and looking at it or having your work be the work that's being looked at. And I think we want to do both as artists, we wanna be able to have um, both opportunities mm -hmm. because both, you know, feed the work we're creating uh, in, in a very deep way. You know, we just, we just wanna be seen, we just wanna be heard, we just wanna be loved and supported <laughs> and held. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, that's super so, honorable right? and honest Always. to say yeah. that. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I think 
uh, in terms of like my biggest inspirations, um, I talked a little bit about Michael Hagen, Mercer Mayer growing up. Ah, I love their work. Ah, so just so beautiful, so pretty, so pretty. Um, but I think as I got older, I think I'm gonna touch a little bit back to, like circle back to what Lauren was saying. And I love writers who, artists, I'm gonna say artists who test the boundaries of like violence and tenderness mm -hmm. and teeter on that edge. So like, like so then writers that I love, Toni Morrison, mm -hmm. Zora Neale Hurston, Maya Angelou, um, Alice Walker, um, there's another one I'm forgetting just at the moment. Oh, Octavia Butler, mm -hmm. <sighs> such mm -hmm. amazing. Um, and then there's Ta Nehisi -Ta Coates. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I love him. And then there's, um, and then I think in terms of an artist who works in the visual realm, who's really spoken to me for the last 10 years in like before, you know, I was in or knew about or conceived of the art world. Cause you know, you're just making paintings and then you hear about it. And then I think it's harder when you're in New York because it's like thrust at you. There is an art world. But um, it would be Kara Walker, because I think with what she does with creating an entire world that is based on narrative and based on storytelling and telling of all like facets of the story, I think that kind of complexity and that kind of nuance I think that is my biggest inspiration that that kind of I would love to that is what I strive to do within my own work and I say that with a lot of humility and, and, and trying but that's that level yeah that's and I'm also her efficiency that. her efficiency yes yeah, I think like, there's something who about like being able to refine as much as she does um into 100%. something um very very simple but not simple not simple yeah and because she has refined it and perfected it to her own mastery of something mm -hmm. that is what this that is what makes it um accessible mm -hmm. and um it's like you can you can reach out you can touch it and you can absorb it in a way like it feels easy to look at at a first glance and then you can sit with it and then you can get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper mm. with it you know it's like it's like beautiful food if you eat it it's beautiful food. and you admire the complexity and all the flavors and all right i've got one last question for us as we uh, start to wrap up here um from our friend christy uh, you talked about the inner struggle between making what is seen in the larger context as important work and making more personal art, art uh, work that you make just for the sake of the making that might seem as less in comparison. Do you find you hesitate to share that work, um, worrying that it's not enough? Uh, and this is such a relatable topic and she's so thankful to hear other artists' thoughts. Oh, that came from uh, <clears throat> someone listening? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you want to go? Um, you, can, you can start. Yeah, the, I'm hesitant to show, I think, everything up until a certain point. Um, and then I, I just kind of release it, and it is what it is. You know, I've shown far less than Ibtisam, so when I have worked on projects, it's it's really been um, that have like a, a wide viewership. It's I've kind of been able to be safe in community, but showing I think your own work, no matter what, is even if it's personal or carries like a broader themes. I think it's still a process of um, allowing yourself to be vulnerable. Right, because at some point you're still show. If you're if you're making honest work, regardless, it's gonna be difficult. You know, if it's honest about a, an idea, if it's honest about a personal experience, um, it's still gonna be difficult. I don't know about you, but and but my process is more like, is this good? Ah, 
is this good? You know? Um, and then it, you know, it varies. I can't, I can't say every day that it feels the same. Yeah. And I know that people, you know, established artists too. I was, um, you know, listening to, to an artist talk and, and it's just interesting how artists of kind of all um, experiences and all levels will have a moment of like, nah. even work that, that, you know, they've put out there and shown. It's, they're just like, no, it, this didn't, this wasn't quite what I needed it to be. Yeah. I and that's okay. Absolutely. And I think it's like, for me, I'll make a piece and I'll be like, oh my God, it's beautiful. Look what I did. I can't believe it. After it's done, mind you, not during. And then um, two days later, I'm over it. Mm -hmm. I'm over it. And I'm over it. A part of the reason I'm over it is because it's just like I'm, I'm very self-critical, which I try not to be, but I am. And so that comes through. And so then I'm just like, I think I, it's like a process of like learning to appreciate where I am and, and sitting with the stages that I'm in and, and loving them for what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of the times I'm just like, yeah, this was cute. Now I wanna make the next big, beautiful thing. And it should be bigger than the last one. And it should be, you know, the, the painting should just be like so much smoother. Yeah. Mm. So um, I think it's, it's hard too, because you have your personal work and then you have your political work. I think in terms of doing it, it just really comes down to, like Lauren said, all of it, you just, Putting yourself out there, regardless of which work it is, is um, is a big challenge. And I'm, I also don't, I don't like to show paintings until they're done. So like you might see it on a story, but I actually don't like to post it mm -hmm. on a, a like permanent. Mm -hmm. And then I, and then you can delete it. So that's nice. I would suggest like uh, listening to a lot of artist talks, mm -hmm. right? And yes, they're talking about like finished work. But I think that under hearing other artists talk about the process sometimes of being unsure um, and still doing it anyway is mm -hmm. helpful to to kind of ground yourself in the reality. Like people aren't just popping out master like they're just not like <laughs> masterpiece one brushstroke. Like it's a process and like being graceful and having some kind of grace with yourself around that. But social media makes it look that way. They off social it's media. It's, I mean that's why. I'm yeah, that's why. Goes back to your early point about Instagram sometimes helps, sometimes a hindrance. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll do one last question because you sort of started to touch on it. So, um, could you speak a little bit? Do you have a favorite piece of the works that you have created? Is it just whatever you're working on right now, your most current piece? Um, what is among your work your most favorite? favorite you know your favorite you don't know <laughs> i don't know I'm, I'm going through them in my brain. i'm trying to i'm trying to kind of differentiate is it my favorite because it's other people's favorite or is it my favorite because it's my favorite you know what i think my favorite is the piece that i'm i'm working on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's my favorite. i think that's the best one um not because it has my face. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's just making that piece was coming to a a very healing moment for me, and I think that's that's why it's my favorite. Mm. Mm. I think my favorite is is the idea that I can't. Um, see right now all the way through so it's like uh, my favorite is the idea right now mm. so. i love that me too is it is it like the perpetual the idea of like what you're figuring out what you're on the cusp of next yeah i think that's i think that's the problem <laughs> <laughs> it's always the next one always the next one yeah, yeah. Mm. oh isn't that that genesis phase you're puzzling it out and figuring it out uh well, thank you both so much. 
This has been wonderful having you both here, having you both on this conversation. Um, I want to really suggest that everyone, we posted a few links in the chat uh, to Lauren and Tizen's Instagrams and also to the live that we did yesterday. I highly, highly recommend watching the live if you haven't already and listening to them talk about their work and seeing what they've referenced here this evening. It's incredible um, and it's just really fantastic. So thank you both so, so much. Um, we'll be sharing this. Thank you, everybody who came out to like listen to us talk. We love you all for supporting yeah. us. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. All right. I hope you all have a wonderful evening and stay tuned on our website. We're going to post this chat. We're going to try and post some links um, to the folks referenced here. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Love you, Moza. Bye.